Welcome to a presentation about fatigue crack closure. My name is Kimmo Karkkeinen and this was my bachelor's thesis subject and also the subject of my research work here at University of Oulu. And we will start off by looking at uh, crack closure as a phenomenon and here the term crack closure doesn't necessarily mean the simple event of an open crack closing but is perhaps better described as the occurrence of premature contact between crack phases in mode 1 cracks. And this contact can be considered to behave like a wedge that gets inserted in the crack and it is caused by many inherent and external factors. And usually a closed mode 1 crack is considered to be non-propagating, so if we have pre premature contact taking place between the crack phases, then the portion of a load cycle in which the crack is closed is extended and this will of course lead to a lower propagation rate. And in linear elastic fracture mechanics considerations, the reduction of cyclic damage is often depicted with the effective stress intensity factor range or delta Kf in place of the normal delta K. And in delta Kf, we substitute the minimum stress intensity factor with the stress intensity factor at the point uh, when crack closure takes place. So that's KCL. And this is a schematic illustration about the principal idea of this uh, phenomenon. And so uh, when the crack is open, uh, there are some mechanisms that uh, behave like a wedge that gets inserted in the crack. And uh, once the crack closures, then uh, contact will happen through this wedge and it will happen sooner uh, than be before. And uh, this will reduce the cyclic damage that the crack tip sees. So then about the history and significance of this phenomenon, uh, it was uh, discovered in the early 1970s when Elbe Wolf observed two opposing crack surfaces coming into contact, even though the external load was still tensile. And before this, crack closure was thought to only occur under compressive or zero loads. And his observation is now known as plasticity-induced crack closure, and many other mechanisms were later discovered. Fatigue crack closure is really significant because it has been successfully used to explain many empirically observed effects in fatigue crack propagation, such as the effect of stress ratio, uh, load history effects, uh, short crack behavior, and notch effects. And uh, this pair of figures uh, illustrates the effect of stress ratio. Uh, so here we can see that with the same stress intensity factor range, a, a uh, higher stress ratio leads to a higher propagation rate. And, but if we account for crack closure by uh, using delta Kf uh, or delta K effective instead of the normal delta K, then the curves land on top of each other. And basically the effect of a stress ratio will get explained by uh, crack closure. So uh, rather than simply sticking to empirical models to predict fatigue damage, uh, crack closure can be a key to understand the physics behind fatigue crack behavior and make even better uh, predictions. Then about the many mechanisms inducing crack closure, the mo most important of which are due to crack tip plasticity, surface roughness and corrosion debris. Uh, Plasticity-induced crack closure, or PICC, is uh, considered to be the main closure mechanism. And it affects uh, closure in the entire parish regime, like we can see in this figure. Then roughness-induced crack closure, or RICC, uh, it is most important under near-threshold loading conditions, but is also partly active at higher loads as well. Uh, then oxide-induced crack closure, which is uh, basically only a near-threshold phenomenon and only occurs when propagation is slow enough for the uh, effective oxide layer to form near the crack tip. And uh, if the contact stresses are enough to cause plastic deformation, then uh, effects of RICC and OICC will become negligible. So what happens here at higher loads is uh, locally a stress ratio of minus one will form uh, and the compression uh, will reduce the effects of RICC and OICC. And basically what these mechanisms do is uh, they shift the effective stress intensity factor range to be lower. So this is uh, good for fatigue life. Next up, uh, more about plasticity-induced crack closure. Uh, 
and uh, it, it is caused by tensile plastic deformation in the cracked plastic zone, so under a mode 1 tensile load, uh, material near the crack tip is elongated in the loading re direction. And uh, because this plastic deformation isn't fully rever reversed in unloading, uh, it leads to residu residual displacements and uh, compressive residual stresses. Uh, and once the crack propagates into its plastic zone, uh, then material behind the crack tip's new location is now plastically stretched and uh, contact between crack flanks will take place sooner in unloading. And PICC is usually more prominent in plane stress, uh, where the material responsible for the elongation flows from the thickness direction and the specimen gets thinner, uh, as opposed to plane strain, where the out-of-plane flow is uh, constrained and uh, material has to flow from uh, behind the crack tip in crack propagation direction. And because, because this more con constrained material flow, uh, the plastic wake that forms in uh, plane strain is uh, smaller than the one uh, that forms in plane stress, and this will lead to uh, plasticity-induced crack closure being uh, uh, less, less prominent in plane strain and uh, way more local. Then about roughness-induced crack closure, uh, it is caused by crack, crack surface roughness along with the relative displacements of the surfaces in the crack plane. And so uh, if, if we have two opposing crack surfaces that are rough, uh, if one is shifted uh, in relation to the other, then uh, uh, this causes incompatibility and premature contact between the crack surfaces. Uh, and under near th threshold loading conditions uh, with plastic zone sizes of the same order of magnitude as grain size, uh, crack tip plasticity can be asymmetric, uh, like we can see in the upper picture. And this can lead to significant relative displacements and high closure levels due to RICC, and uh, they depend highly on grain size. And with higher loads, plasticity tends to be symmetric, so this this more global mechanism isn't active. But uh, in addition to this, there's a, a more local mechanism in which uh, local plastic deformations can occur in the uh, roughness peaks and cause them to bend. And this will also uh, introduce premature contact and cause uh, roughness-induced crack closure. And uh, roughness-induced crack closure can explain, for example, the uh, grain size effects. Then uh, oxide-induced crack closure, uh, it is caused by the formation of an oxide layer uh, on the fresh crack surfaces and uh, because the volume of these oxides is greater in comparison to the base material, uh, it will cause premature contact. And uh, with this layer continuously breaking under cyclic loading, uh, it will get much thicker uh, in compared to a layer that forms on a static surface, and uh, this thickness is also affected by humidity and temperature. And uh, what these oxides do is that they tend to escape from the crack surfaces, especially close to the crack edges, uh, like we can see in the right picture. And this will reduce OICC, but we can also prevent this emission uh, by using tape, for example. Uh, to seal the crack from its sides, and uh, this will make it so that no oxides can uh, can escape the crack from the sides. Uh, like we can see, this leads to a much thicker oxide layer that is also homogeneous in the thickness direction, making OICC uh, way more prominent. And uh, OICC can explain some near threshold effects like uh, environmental dependence. Then about modeling crack closure, uh, nowadays finite element method is probably the best tool for researchers to study crack closure uh, because uh, traditional fatigue testing is kind of difficult and uh, expensive and uh, it is really hard to measure those uh, tiny uh, displacements and effects near the crack tip. So uh, that is why we turn to numerical modeling. Uh, 
And most of these uh, numerical studies consider only PICC and uh, way less of them are about RICC and OICC and only a, only a handful consider combined effects. So a lot of work has to be done in this front uh, still. And in PICC modeling, uh, some of the things to keep an eye on, for example, are element size, uh, growth scheme and material model. Uh, for example, the mesh has to be very fine near the crack tip to capture the effects of uh, street, uh, steep stress and strain gradients that take place in uh, near the crack tip. And uh, some thought has to be put into uh, how to grow the crack. Uh, so growth is usually realized by uh, releasing the uh, crack tip node or set of nodes of their boundary condition uh, symmetry symmetry boundary condition uh, uh, at some point of the load cycle uh, usually the maximum load and every few load cycles so we can basically adjust the propagation rate by determining how often to grow the crack and uh, usually the growth is much faster in these simulations than uh, in normal fatigue testing to uh, reduce computational effort and uh, we have to keep in mind that this this can also uh, lead to uncertainty in the results. All right, then uh, some of my own uh, simulation results. Uh, this is a plasticity-induced crack closure simulation uh, done in Abacus, and uh, it is also compared to a similar study uh, conducted by uh, Kamas and colleagues in 2018. And this analysis uh, considers an aluminium CT specimen uh, with a thickness of 3 mm, isotropic hardening, and so on. And the crack is grown for uh, 290 uh, micrometers, which is uh, equivalent to a fifth of the ductile plastic zone size in plane stress. And the data presented here are the opening and closure levels from the last cycle of the analysis. Uh, these quantify the level of rock closure usually uh, pretty well, so uh, that is why uh, this is presented here. And uh, the horizontal axis is the thickness axis of the specimen half thickness. So this is the mid plane and this is the surface. And uh, a vertical axis is the normalized opening and closure level. And uh, we can see that the agreement with the reference data is pretty decent, uh, some deviation here in the mid-plane. And also uh, we must note that the opening and closure levels are much lower here in mid-plane, where plane strain uh, is the dominant uh, condition, uh, as opposed to in the surface where the levels are much higher because uh, their plane stress dominates. So this is uh, in accordance with uh, what we noted before, that uh, PICC is much more prominent in plane stress than in plane strain. And uh, also we can see that the opening uh, level data uh, or the opening level is uh, a little bit higher than the closure level. And this is what usually gets reported in literature. So in conclusion, uh, crack closure is a really important fatigue uh, phenomenon which causes premature contact between the crack phases leading to reduction in the fatigue crack propagation rate. And uh, it is significant because many empirically observed deviations from the traditional predictions can be explained in a physical manner with fatigue crack closure. So it really seems to be a key phenomenon in understanding uh, the mechanics of uh, crack propagation better. And the finite element method shows exceptional potential in broadening the understanding of crack closure. All right, that's it. Uh, thank you for listening and uh, have a good day.